I'd like to tell you a love story. I'd like to tell you a love story that is the most important love story ever told. If you joined us in Matins this morning, you would have heard the readings, the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful readings in the Odes where it says that Christ had come, a light had burst forth from the cave. In the Old Testament, we hear that at one time the sin of man had become so egregious and so terrible that God decided he was going to destroy the earth and all that was in it. Except that he found one righteous man and his family. And so he set about the task of giving this man the information that he needed that which would save him and his family from the encroaching waters so they wouldn't be destroyed. And so we hear in this point, even that the sin of mankind had become so terrible and such a stench rising from earth <coughs> into heaven that even then, in God's wrath, he touched this man with love and saved him. The waters rose, and those who would not repent and those who would not turn, those who were set in their ways of sin, they were utterly destroyed. Now, some people today might say to us, in fact, a question was asked of me this week. He said, if God is a God of love, how can he destroy people? How can he sin? How can we justify a loving God in the existence of hell? Hell was never really created for us. It's a place that was to be sent uh, Satan and those who fell with him from heaven. However, the question was asked, how can God who loves also judge us? How can he cast anyone into hell? There's an answer to that. This might amaze you. God does not cast anybody into hell. People put themselves in hell because of their unwillingness to repent, to turn around. And so we see in the story of the flood, God's wrath was justly kindled. And in that kindling of his wrath, those who did not turn, who did not repent, who would not make a sacrifice of themselves and their lives and their offerings unto the Lord, they were placed where they belonged. They were placed where they wanted to be. But I said that I was going to tell you a love story. And I did. <coughs> you see... After the rains had ceased, the water started subsiding, Noah needed a sign. Where were we going to land? All I can see is water. All I can see around me is water. Surely we are not let just simply live in this ark upon the waters. So he sent forth a bird in the ark came back. Sprig. Sprig in his, in his beak. To let him know God is not forsaking them upon the waters. And thus was provided dry land. And the generations of Noah increased. They set upon the earth and spread out again, made their homes, remembering the Lord was faithful to them. They offered sacrifices upon the altars. They, they mended their ways. When they sinned, they fell into repentance. And as we hear in the Gospel reading today, the 14 generations passed. 14 generations of all those people who came before, the lineage that led to Joseph, that led to, the, to that one moment in time where God decided that he was going to now send salvation into the world. Here's how it was done. Here's the beauty of love. Did God send a prince into the world dressed in the finest array, raiments of, of fabrics and jewels? Did he have a crown upon his brow? Was he born in a palace? Was he born in a place of, of great splendor where there was gold adorning the walls? 
He was born in a simple cave that it may be known from darkness it shine forth light. You see, when we say Emmanuel, the word that was used, Emmanuel, God is with us. And from in the midst of darkness, there came forth light, the light of the world, the salvation of the world. Here's the thing. From the lowliness of means, God sent exactly what was needed. He sent the bridge. This is what we are getting ready to celebrate this very week. He sent that which would be the bridge from us to the Father. No God of the pagans, no other idol, no other worship deity of that time ever deigned to do this. That he loved his creation so much, he sent his only son. And so we see the plan of salvation unfolding, not only in some spiritual sense, but also in the flesh too. Remember, as we as Orthodox Christians, we worship with all of our senses. We are engaged with our, with our eyes, with our nose, with our mouth, our hands, our hearts, our spirit. And surely salvation has come to us, not only as a vague spirit, but also in the flesh, before us. And hence we know that we have the icon of the Christ here. We know what he looked like. We know what, what he was like. The apostles touched him. We knew he was here. And so all the world will know and can never, ever say that this moment had not occurred. You see, as the, as the Apostle John said, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A strange way to save the world. How many kings claim to have done this? There's a song that I remember, a contemporary Christian song, How Many Kings Step Down from Their Throne? How Many Lords Abandoned Their Home? How Many Greats Became the Least for Me? How Many Gods Poured Out Their Hearts to Romance a World That Was Torn All Apart? How Many God gave up their son. Truly, this is a lost story. And as we are entering into the season, as we are coming to that moment when we celebrate Emmanuel, God is with us. This very week, we celebrate this moment again. 2,000 years ago, it is as poignant and as real and as valid as if it happened just yesterday. Still with us. Let us live like he's truly with us. Let Christ be reborn in your hearts and in your minds and your souls this very season, in the very moment, have him reborn in your life and walk with him throughout all the year. We who are Orthodox Christians, we can claim truly, God is with us. God is with us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.